what we're looking at, is we're going to finish up lesson six. And basically, Paul is uh, in prison, and he's struggling. And as he's struggling in prison, what comes to his mind is the Kunepo. And remember that all the Jewish people, after they celebrate the Passover, would sing Psalm 113, 114, 115, 16, 17, 118, 136. And as they read these, these psalms, those psalms became known as the hymn, as the hymns of the church. And as they were singing those hymns, they were reflecting. Paul in prison was using David's Psalm 113 from all of his struggles through pain. Do you understand that when you and I go through pain, it produces something that God can use in other people's lives? Paul was using David's Psalm about his pain as Paul was in prison. That's why we use the Word of God in our lives to comfort us, but most of the parts of the Word of God we use are produced by somebody else's pain. And the 113th Psalm is all about David's pain. Well, the, the next aspect of the 113th Psalm is that when we pray and praise the Lord in our pain, we do so humbly. Notice what it says in verse six up there. Who humbles himself, behold the things that are in the heavens and in the earth. And it, it talks about the fact that God is drawn to humility. If you want God's attention, humble yourself. Now, humility is not thinking little of yourself. Some people just think, you know, they think I'm nothing, I'm awful, you know, leave me alone, I'm nothing. That's not humility. That's actually a form of selfishness. Whenever we want attention to ourself, for whatever reason, it's not humility. It's when we want to be like a mirror reflecting the glory to the Lord. That's humility. And that's what David is talking about. Then we, we learn to meditate. Do I get one beautiful? You get the first one. <laughs> oh no, I don't want the first one. You are so sweet. Do you, I don't want to touch them because my hands are dirty. Isn't she sweet? Bonnie is the greatest earthly gift I ever got. Salvation is a heavenly gift. Okay. Thank you. Enjoy my cookie. <laughs> Do you know what Paul said? He said, remember the words of our Lord, it's more blessed to what? Give than receive. It truly is. Meditatively, look, look how the 113th Psalm reflects David's pain, but what he says is, he raises the poor out of the dust, he lifts the needy out of the ash heap, that he may seat him with princes. David is meditating on what God has done in his life. David was the youngest son. David was the overlooked son. David was the son that, the, that his brothers didn't like. And David says, he raised me up out of the ash heap and he made me to sit with princes. Basically, the lesson is this. Prayer and praise gets us through the pits. Prayer and praise not only gets us through the pits, but also we pray for those who are likewise suffering. Look, look at the ending of the 113th Psalm, verse 16. And I'll let, whoop, the wind constantly blows my Bible, but look at verse 16. The heaven, even the heavens. I mean, whoop, sorry, that was 115. 16. O oh Lord, I'm truly your servant. I am your servant. Verse 17. I will offer to you the sacrifice of thanksgiving. I will call on. That's 116. Sorry. I'm trying to get to 113. 113, it says this, he raises the poor out of the dust, he seats him with princes, and then look at the very last part of verse 9, like a joyful mother of children, praise the Lord. The Lord says, we come out of the pits when we praise the Lord. It doesn't change the circumstances, it changes our orientation. So, 
How do we start a personal barrier to the pits? Don't be surprised by trouble. The Bible says all that are godly in Christ Jesus, Paul said to Timothy, are going to suffer. Number two, live with mysteries. We won't always know why things happen. We're not supposed to know. And accept your situation. Accept the things you can't change. See, many people dig a pit for themselves because they say, I wish I could have what they have. I don't know why I don't have the opportunity or the resources or the family or the whatever. Accept your situation from the Lord. And then remember this. This is the rocky barren land that David was hiding. He was sleeping on those rocks that you see. He was coming down to this waterfall that he'd played in as a little boy and drinking water and saying, even if Saul's sending his army after me, I'm going to trust the Lord. And the Lord raised him up out of the pit of his sadness. This one is about depression. Depression is one of the most widespread struggles that people have. Depression is when you feel like you don't want to do anything because you're struggling with how sad you are. And so the 142nd Psalm is a psalm about depression. Remember, everything we're talking about, Psalm 142, is uh, basically a part of the life of David from 3,000 years ago, and it, it is a historic event that God uses in our lives. And the 142nd Psalm, if you want to turn there, in your Bibles, and I'll put my marker there, I won't lose it. Uh, Who would I leave off with? The new old, so I, I think that I'm on daffodil. Can you read, do you have the superscripts in your Bible? Okay, everybody listen as Daffodil reads the context of the 142nd Psalm. In the what? This actually is a psalm. The 142nd Psalm is a, a prayer of David while he was in the cave. And we even know what cave he was in. Uh, it tells us in the um, first Samuel that he was in the cave of Adullam. It's, it's an actual physical location that's still there. Adullam. Adullam. And that cave you can still go to. When we take people to Israel, we drive the bus out into Israel's countryside and we park and we walk up a hill and at the top of the hill into the mountain is that cave. In fact, some groups, uh, th there are Bible colleges in Israel, Part of their schooling is they hike to that place and the whole class, the teacher and all the students, sleep in the cave where David slept. And you know what? It's awful. You can't find a comfortable place. It's dirty, it has bugs, it smells still. But David wrote, and this is what he wrote. This is the essence of the 142nd Psalm. And I'm going to go backwards and I'm going to tell you the conclusion, then we'll get to the conclusion. But the conclusion of the psalm is, when we're depressed, David said to the Lord, bring my soul out of prison. Why? So I can feel better? No. That I may praise your name. The righteous shall surround me, for you shall deal bountifully with me. This psalm, this psalm is one of the most encouraging psalms because it reminds us that depression is not a sin. Now I want to repeat that. Many people feel 
that Christians are supposed to always feel good. And it's like you're supposed to smile all the time and never have a problem and just act like, almost like, you know, like plastic. That, that you're, you never stop smiling. Did you know the world doesn't like that? Normal people have struggles. Christians are normal, we have struggles. So what happens when a Christian struggles and their life is not uh, kind of like, um, do you know the camp director here, Wadi? Isn't he kind of excited all the time? I mean, do you remember we were eating a meal and he drove by on his motorcycle and said, hello everybody! Were any of you in there when he did that? It was like, wow, does he drink coffee all the time? You know, <laughs> it's just amazing. There are two types of personalities of people. There are the wadis, and then there are people that live in the minor key. You know in music there's the major key and the minor key, and when you play the minor key, it sounds, it's a little different kind of music. Most music is the major key and the minor key is, is, is kind of uh, accompanying it, but most, most people, when they think of the Christian life, they think of the major key. They think of all the, the uh, excitement. In fact, most of the Bible is the major key. Saints are fearlessly witnessing, churches are valiantly serving, and everybody is even singing in prison. But side by side by, with that is this. God's word, right here in Psalm 142, gives us a glimpse of men and women in the Bible who were sad, discouraged, and depressed. Now listen to this. God never corrects them for that. He doesn't say, that's wrong, stop it. You see, some people go through life kind of in a minor key sadness. Now they're joyful in the Lord, but they're never exuberantly like that. L let me show you what I mean. Because Moses, Elijah, Hezekiah, Job, Ezra, Jeremiah, Jonah, and Paul all had a shared struggle. Now we're going to be reading a lot more verses. We're going to jump back to Hazel in just a minute, and then we're going to go across to Elisha. And so everybody get ready. And Hazel's going to get to read to us Numbers 11, 14, and 15. And then Elisha's going to get to read to us 1 Kings 19, 4. And then, um, then we will go to Hezekiah in just a minute. So... so uh, Hold on for a minute there, uh, Roland. But first of all, let's hear what Moses said. As soon as you find that, uh, Hazel, uh, and everybody think about Moses, the one that knew God face to face, the one that went up in the mountain for 40 days and glowed, this is what he felt. Verse 14 and 15. Do you think Moses is very happy right now? What's he actually asking the Lord to do? He wants to die. That's how sad he is. That's how troubled he is. Moses, who knew God, you know what it says? Nobody else was like Moses. He knew God face to face. He spent so much time with God, his skin started shining. People couldn't look at him. Can you imagine someone, and when you looked at him, it was like looking at a flashlight, you know, that shines right in your face. And so he had to what? Cover his face with a cloth. Moses had a struggle with life. Moses said, I can't go on. Kill me and take me to heaven. I'm ready to go. Now let's listen to Elijah. Elisha, can you read about Elijah? Elijah.
Is Elijah happy? He is so sad, he says, Lord, take my life. I can't go on. Those are two of the most famous people in the Bible. Those two come back to see Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration, no less, right? Moses and Elijah are up there. Those two are never condemned for their attitude. They just were so sad. It was so hard what they were called to do. They just couldn't go on. So that's, that's a fascinating uh, account. Now Hezekiah, Roland, if you can go to 2 Kings chapter 20, I want you to think about what's going on. And before Roland reads uh, chapter 20, verses 2 and 3, Hezekiah has a terminal illness. Now see, the reason why I'm sharing this lesson with you is all of you are going to have friends or relatives that get the word that they have cancer or they have respiratory problems or they have heart problems or they have something wrong with them and the doctors say, I'm sorry to tell you this, but you only have six months left to live or three months or whatever. And do you know what happens when we as humans find out that everything we were planning on doing we aren't going to be able to do and we're just getting sick and our life on earth is going to be over. We do what Hezekiah did. Hezekiah, when he was faced with terminal illness, turned his face to the wall and started crying. He was so sad. Hezekiah, a king that knew God personally. Okay, Roland, read us verses 2 and 3. Bitterly, wow. Okay, next, two more tremendous saints, and we're going to zip over to uh, Ephel. Is that how you say it, or Apple? Ephel. F for with F sound or P? P. Apple, like apple, like apple. <laughs> ah, apple. I love it. And uh, you look up Psalm one nineteen verse twenty five, and then uh, Ara you get Lamentations 120. Okay, now before you read these, these are unbelievably important people in the Bible. I already told you about Ezra. Ezra's the one that discipled the whole nation of Israel. Ezra's the one that brought the Bible back to the people of Israel. He's the one that invented the synagogue. He's the one that started the scribes that copied the Bible that, that are still around in Christ's time. Ezra's the one that got to write the longest chapter in the Bible. And yet, Apple is going to get to tell us what was going on in his life. And then you get to Jeremiah. Jeremiah is the prophet that God used to write the book that explains the whole purpose of God for putting Israel into their captivity. But those two men both struggled with something. And what they struggled with is something that everyone struggles with, and that they show us the way out, okay? Apple, can you read uh, verse 25 of the 119th Psalm? Perfect, thank you. What does cling to the dust mean? It means you're, it's like you're face down on the ground. That's how low, you can't get lower than that. If you're on the ground, you can't get lower unless you dig it and then you're still on the ground. You know what I mean? I mean, he's saying I'm as low as you can get. But what does he say? He, what does he not say? He doesn't say, uh, I, I am horribly, wickedly sinful. No, he just says my emotions, my soul, how I feel is this low. But what's the next part that Apple read? 
Bring me life according to your what? Word. If you see someone that's struggling and sad and can't go on, one of the greatest things you can do for them is read a scripture to them. Think about that. Think about the power of the Word of God. You can give them a present, but the present can't get inside of their emotions. You can even sit by them, and your comfort is nice, but there's only one thing we can give people that can go inside of them. You see, verse 125 says, the Bible can come inside and actually touch our soul. Isn't that exciting? Our emotions. Okay, the next one is probably the saddest one of all. And uh, Ara, can you read about Jeremiah in Lamentations 1.20? Why was Jeremiah so sad? Do any of you know his life? You know, Jeremiah wrote the book of Jeremiah and Jeremiah wrote Lamentations. God told Jeremiah, number one, he told him he could never get married. How do you like that one? Everybody else in Jeremiah's town, Jerusalem, got married. Everyone got married. There were not people that weren't married in the Bible times. It just was kind of like, you got married. That no one could imagine being single. Everyone, because you married within your tribe, and there were always people from your tribe, and the parents worked it out. Parents went to other parents and you know, if Isaac and I are dads, I'd say, hey, I've got a daughter and you've got a really nice son. They're one year old. When they're older, we're going to be related, okay? And Isaac would say, yep. It wasn't, you wondered if you were going to get married. You got married. And so everyone else in his world was married. And God said to Jeremiah, and you can read about it in chapter 12 to 15, of that book, God said, you will never get married. You will never have a wife to come home to. Every time you come to your house, it will be dark. Every time you come to your house, there will be no food. And there will never be laughter in your house. There will never be joy in your house. You will never have the joy of a family. Wow. That's enough to make you sad. He went through life without anyone close to him. If you continue reading, the Lord says, your own family will oppose you. In fact, he said, Jeremiah said, my family tries to get me in trouble and they report me and they, they try and get me harm. Then he said, you are going to be your ministry will be rejected. Now, Jeremiah was a prophet, and he preached the gospel for God for 40 years. Guess how many people responded at his crusades? As far as we know, in 40 years, no one ever responded to Jeremiah's ministry. How would you like to have his missionary prayer letter? And you got it for 40 years and he still never had even one convert. Would you stop supporting him? That's basically what Israel did. They said, you're a failure. And so the whole book of Lamentations that Ara just read, chapter 1, verse 20, explains to us how strong how much life was a struggle to him. And basically he said, Lord, I'm in distress. 
my soul is troubled, my heart is overturned within me. Now, for all of you, do you all know the, the very middle verse of the Book of Lamentations? Exactly. How do I know it's the very middle verse? You know what, I'm going to once again be late, but I want to show you something most people don't even realize. We are studying the Psalms, and remember we talked about acrostic Psalms? How many verses are in acrostic Psalms? Does anybody remember I told you? How many letters are in the Hebrew alphabet? 22. Okay, so an acrostic Psalm is a 22 verse Psalm. Okay, chapter 1 of Jeremiah has 22 verses. Chapter 2 of Jeremiah has 22 verses. Chapter 3 of Jeremiah has 22 verses. But chapter 3 goes on and has another poem because actually chapter 3 has 66 verses. And chapter 4 has 22 verses, and chapter 5 has 22 verses. So Jeremiah is built like a pyramid. Here's a poem, here's a poem, here's a poem. Ending with the 22nd verse, the poem starts over, and the very middle verse is Jeremiah 3.23 through 44, and then 45 to 66, and then chapter 4, and then chapter 5. So the very middle verse, and the Hebrews thought of a seven part as the first and last go together, the second and sixth go together, the third and fifth go together, and they considered the fourth poem to be the capstone, and the 23rd verse is that verse. Now look what it says in Lamentations 3.23. Jeremiah confesses what helped him when he never got married and his family didn't like him and he had 40 years of nobody listening to him, he said, verse 22, so right here, he's ending this poem with the 22nd verse and he says, through the Lord's mercies we're not consumed because his compassions fail not. And here's the, the highest point of the book of Lamentations. They are new every morning Great is your faithfulness. Verse 24, the Lord is my portion, therefore I hope in him. Jeremiah becomes one of the most beautiful pictures that God can encourage us. Okay, uh, Jonah 4.8, we don't have time to read it, but he said it's better for me to die. Okay, so Jonah had the same struggle as Moses and Hezekiah and Elijah and Ezra and Jeremiah and as we're going to see, David. Also, Job. Job. After all those things happened to him, he says this in Job 3.11, Why didn't I die at birth? Why am I even alive? What did Paul say in 2 Corinthians 7.5, that verse up there? He said, We have trouble on every side and no rest. We're afflicted. Conflicts outside, fears inside. Paul, he's the guy singing in prison. Paul sang in prison because the Lord comforted him. It doesn't mean he didn't have struggles. Paul was someone that struggled with his emotions. Here's another one. You've all heard of Martin Luther. Martin Luther was so depressed that he could not go forward. He felt the devil was in the room with him. And so one of the most famous events in Martin Luther's life is he picked up his inkwell. You know, they used to have this little pot with ink and they'd put their pen in it, you know, and write. And he took the inkwell and he threw it at the wall. When I used to deliver Bibles into the communist countries, East Germany was in a communist country, I went to Luther's hometown, Wittenberg, which was in a communist country then, and they still had Luther's study, and you could still see on the wall this stain where that inkwell he threw at the devil. Now, you can't hit Satan with an inkwell, 
But what he did do is this. He wrote a song, and it goes like this. A mighty fortress is our God, and though this world with devils filled should threaten to undo us, we will not fear, for God hath willed his truth to triumph through us. The prince of darkness grim, and that's when he threw his inkwell at the devil, but he wrote this, we tremble not for him, his rage we can endure, for lo, his doom is sure, one little word will fell him. What do all these people have in common? Jeremiah, he had the sorrow of not getting married. He had his family opposing him and his ministry rejected. What did he do? He wrote, great is your faithfulness. Paul is in prison and Paul sings the psalm that David wrote when God brought his soul out of prison. Another two that, that aren't very Philippine, but they are from Britain, from England, Charles Haddon Spurgeon up there and John Henry Jowett were two of the most well-known English-speaking preachers. Spurgeon was so discouraged. He preached in the 1880s to 25,000 people in his church. 25,000. Do you know how many people that is? Before television and microphones and the internet? He is still considered to be one of the greatest preachers of the gospel the world's ever seen. Did you know when he got done speaking on Sunday to 25,000 people, he got so discouraged that he went to bed. He would not get out of bed. On Monday, he wouldn't get out of bed, and every week his wife did the same thing. She hired people to pick him up and put him on this little bed. They pushed him out to the curb. They put him in a carriage. They put him on a train. They drove him down to the coast. And he went to a place on the coast where the sea breezes would blow. And finally, by about Wednesday, he was undiscouraged. And he would get back on the train on Thursday and start studying Friday and Saturday and preach to 25,000 people on Sunday. And then he would be so discouraged his wife would put him on the train. That's very great discouragement. Yet he knew the Lord, he loved the Lord, and his books are still being used all over the world. Amazing. Okay, how do you overcome depression? David tells us. The 142nd Psalm tells us. Basically, here are the steps. This is David's testimony, how to overcome depression. Depression is only sin if we stay depressed. Every one of God's servants came out. Ezra, when his soul clung to the dust, the Lord quickened him. Jeremiah, when, when he was, um, when Jeremiah was at the, the saddest moment, he said, this is why I'm not consumed. God is faithful and he's my portion. So what does David say? Well, Psalm 142, and uh, if you go back there, we'll just stay in the 142nd Psalm till we finish this class so you can just be in one place. Psalm 142, let me get there with you. You can kind of summarize the whole Psalm in verses three and four. David said, when my spirit was overwhelmed within me, then you knew my path. What David is saying is, even when I'm, I'm in this cave and I feel hopeless, you're still there. Now, here's David's testimony. How to overcome depression. These, the, the pictures of Ezra, of Moses, of Jonah that we looked at, the verses you all read, those are, are what goes on in our minds. We say, I'm overwhelmed, I'm sad, I, you know, I feel bad that everybody else has something, it's terrible, my family doesn't like me, nobody's responding to my ministry. If you ever go through any of those feelings, this is what David said is the way out, because those are the feelings he had. Number one, be sure there's no unconfessed or unforsaking sin. Now, if this area had malaria and there were screens 
on the windows so the mosquitoes couldn't get in, what would you think of what's going on in the back? Look in the back. What do you see in the back that would be terrible if there were malaria mosquitoes? What's that? The door is open. What would that mean? Even though we had screens and the mosquitoes were all buzzing outside, if they were smart, where would they go? Now I want you to think about something. Unconfessed, unforsaken sin is like living in a malaria swamp and leaving the back door open. Satan comes in the back door. How does he come in the back door? It says in Ephesians 4.27 that when we have sin in our life, it gives a place for Satan to attack us. When we confess our sins, it puts screen over the door for the mosquitoes of the devil. When we don't confess our sins, it opens the back door to the devil. So the first thing, depression, if it's, if it's not sin, it isn't a product of an unconfessed sin. See, you, you, you ha if you have depression in your life, you have to first say, wait a minute, Lord, is there anything I'm being disobedient in? Am I depressed because I'm not reading the Bible? Am I depressed because I'm deliberately disobeying the Lord? Am I depressed because I am grieving your spirit? So number one, deal with sin. Number two, share your burdens. Do you know what one of the, the early church's great blessings were? They all lived by each other. The early church was a community, kind of like here. You know, this little 33 acres. Everybody lives close to each other, walks by each other, knows each other. We eat together. We're, we're all around each other. Share your burdens. First, you tell the Lord all your fears, all your struggles, all your pains. But the Bible says that we're supposed to share our burdens with other believers. Every one of us should have someone in life that is our prayer partner, our our mutual helper in the Lord, kind of like accountability. And when you go through life, as a pastor, the chairman of the elders was always my partner. He is the head of the elders of the church, and I was the pastor of the church. I was an elder, but he was my leader, because he was the chairman. And every week we got together, and we always shared our burdens. And I would ask him, how are you doing with your wife? How are you doing with your children? How are you doing with your job? Where are you reading in the Bible? What verses are you memorizing? And are you closing all the doors to the devil in your life? Are you confessing and forsaking sin? And then he would ask me the same thing. You need someone like that in your life. Now you probably have one because you're in the dorms and you have Dina Men and you know all these people, right? You have all this accountability. But when you're not at Word of Life, you still need that. You still need to develop. In fact, perhaps some of your friends you make here while you're seeking the Lord, while you're going through school, would be great to say, could we be accountability partners? Could you pray for me? Could I share my burdens with you? And, and basically, that's one of the ways we get out of the pits. A burden shared cuts it in half. Did you know if you share your burden with someone, it's like they help you hold it up. A blessing shared multiplies it, but a burden shared lessens it. And so share your burdens. Thirdly, abandon self-pity. Many people get depressed because they look in the mirror and they don't look like what they look like. Many people get depressed because they're looking at other people and they're saying, how come they get a new whatever? How come their parents, how come they have parents? I don't have parents. You know what I mean? And we pity ourselves. When we pity ourselves, we remove the blessing of the Lord helping us. The Lord doesn't want us hurting ourselves by this self-pity. Next point. Look at Psalm 142 and verse 5. Look what else David said. Not only did he, he uh, confess and pour out his soul, but in verse 5, he started discovering things about God. You see, if you stop feeling sorry for yourself when you're sad and depressed and start saying, Lord, what is it you'd like me to learn? 
What can I learn in this, this time of struggle? And verse five, look what he does. He says, I cried out to you, O Lord, and I said, you are my refuge and my portion. Cave times reap discoveries about the Lord. Cave times also is a way to get to know the Lord personally, intimately. Notice what he says. He says, attend to my cry. Verse six, deliver me. David got to know God, not at a distance. When you're sad and when you're discouraged and when you're troubled and you cry out to the Lord, he comes close. It says in James 4, he draws near. Also, depression means it's time to flee to the Lord. When I'm depressed, I learn that you alone are my true refuge. That's what David learned. That, notice what he says in verse 5. He says, I cried out and I says, wow, Lord, you're my refuge. That's that declaration is when we actually find that the Lord is our refuge. When we're depressed, we need to say, you, you're the only one. Think about it. When Jeremiah came home to a dark house, who was the only one in the house to help him? It wasn't his mother, it wasn't his wife. Who was it? The Lord. That's the friend that never leaves us or forsakes us. Next, depression means it's time to feed on the Lord as your portion. Uh, it's kind of sad not to have all the kids here, but during the conference, all these families had their little kids. And uh, little Ethan, you know, Asaph and Ethan, little Ethan um, sits in his little chair and his mother takes the food and squashes it all up and gets it just small enough for him and puts it on that little, I was watching her, they sat with us yesterday for the meal, and on that little tiny spoon that's only that big and puts it in his mouth. Do you know what we call that? Your portion. It's as much as you can, when you're little, you can't eat a boiled egg, you'll choke. You need it little. And what he says here is, the Lord is my portion. He knows just what I need. When I'm depressed, I learn that you're the, just what I need. You're the great physician, just like the Bible prescribes for us. The next thing David learned is, it's time to speak to the Lord. Uh, in verse 6, at the beginning, he said, uh, attend to my cry. It's time to speak to the Lord. It's time to call him. It's time to cry out to him. Do you remember what Peter did? Peter was walking on the water, and all of a sudden, he was, as long as he looked at the Lord, he was on top of the water. But when he looked at the storm, what started happening to him? He started sinking. What did he do? Instantly he said, Lord, help me. And what did Jesus do? He reached out to him instantly and rescued him. That's what David is learning. It's time to cry out to the Lord. He wants to rescue us. And David's testimony goes on. Depression means it's time to trust in the Lord as your Redeemer and worship Him. In chapter 7, I mean in verse 7, say to the Lord, when I'm depressed, you are the one that I talk to. He says, bring my soul out of prison so I can praise your name, in verse 7. It's time to trust the Lord, to worship Him, to praise Him. Also, it's time to rest in Him. Look, look at the end of verse 7. He says, for you will deal bountifully with me, Psalm 142, 7, at the end. It's time to rest. It's trying to say, Lord, I'm in jail, I'm worshiping you, and you can take care of me. As, as David said, I'm in the cave, you'll help me. As Jeremiah said, I'm going to be alone for life, nobody's going to help me, nobody's going to respond to me but you're faithful. It's just to, to trust that the Lord can provide. What does uh, cave times do? Well, we aren't gonna go into Psalm 57, but I'll just give you this. David also wrote in Psalm 142, he wrote about the same experience in Psalm 57. It was so good, he wrote too about it. And he said in Psalm 57, what he learned in that cave is, God is gracious, God is a refuge, and God is the only one that's able to help me. 
That's the truth that David applied. He continues in Psalm 57 and says that the Lord is the one, and I'll actually read the words, um, and, and in your Bibles, you should notice in Psalm 57 what it says, just a second. It says in Psalm 57, the superscript that you all are gonna find in your studies, it says, a miktam of David when he fled from Saul into the cave. It's the same event as 142. It's, it's in 1 Samuel 22. But what he says in, in verse seven of Psalm 57 is, my heart is steadfast, my heart is steadfast, Lord, you've established me. He says in, in the middle of verse seven, I will sing and give praise. Then he says in verse eight and nine, I will praise you, I will sing to you among the nations. David, you know what I think about? I think in pictures and I see David inside that cave with 400 men and they're all not very nice. And David isn't very nice until all of a sudden he starts letting the Lord establish him, change his heart. And all of a sudden he starts talking about the Lord. And those other men, they go, you're in the same cave I am. What got into you? And David, in verse 7, says, my God, I praise, verse 9, his mercy reaches to the heavens. And I want to exalt the Lord, verse 11, uh, real quickly, God gives us an audience. If you allow the Lord to encourage your heart, people will listen to you. I think that's why you're in the Bible Institute. And I think that's why the Lord takes all of us through really hard times. So that when the Lord encourages us in jail, in a cave, in our very difficult ministry, other people listen to us. Everybody is happy when everything's going good. It's when we're joyful when things aren't going good. He said, God is loyal, his mercies never fail, and God wants us to worship him. Basically this, let's turn, and we have one minute before Roland gets up and uh, hits the buzzer. Turn to 1 Thessalonians 5 in your New Testaments. I wanna show you how Paul wrote a letter to people just like us. And this fifth chapter has more commands. Uh, they're called imperatives. So 1 Thessalonians chapter five is full of commands. Now look, those of you in the front can see them. I use a pink marker. Do you see all that pink? All those pink words are marking the Greek words that are commands. And here's what it says. Verse, the, the commands start in verse 11. Therefore, what's the word in your Bible? 1 Thessalonians 5.11, therefore what? Comfort, that's a command. And also edify. Edify means that you come alongside someone and you, you help them, you encourage them, you kind of lift them up. The next one in verse 13, be at peace, that's a command. Verse 14, comfort, uphold, be patient. Verse 15, pursue what is good. Verse 16, rejoice. That's a command. Verse 17, pray. Verse 18, give thanks. Verse 19, don't quench. Every one of those, and they keep going. Uh, do not despise, test, abstain. All of those are commands to the early church to do to each other. You see, all of us are struggling. We should all pray for one another we should all declare the Lord is faithful, and we all should be, Roland, you're such a blessing. We should be encouraging one another, and that's what Paul said in 1 Thessalonians 5.